Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnivale, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, a.k.a. Mr. Valuation. I'm going to do something a little differently today with this video. I'm going to talk about why value investing is so important. No matter what your investment strategy is, no matter what your goals or objectives are, I believe everybody ought to be practicing value investing. And even beyond that, I want to also point out how value investing works and why it works and why it's so important. This is going to be a series of videos. This will be part one. And I'm titled this particular video, A Primer on Valuation, where I'm going to be testing the wisdom of Ben Graham's formula. Now, Ben Graham's formula, as I've talked about many times, is really a formula that applies to slow-growing companies. And I'm going to be covering why that's so important as I kind of go through the video today. So we're going to call this a primer on valuation, testing the wisdom of Ben Graham's formula, part one. Now, if an investor is going to successfully invest in common stocks over their lifetime, there are three important questions that must be correctly answered. What to invest in, when to invest, and of course, when to sell. The first question deals with finding the right company or companies that you believe can deliver the returns you are seeking. Of course, this is a multifaceted question that also relates to and deals specifically with the individual investor's goals, risk tolerances, and objectives. In addition to the prospects of the company in question, it's also important to make sure it meets the objectives of the investor. For example, if a company pays a dividend or not may be a prime consideration for certain investors who are income-oriented. On the other hand, the investor looking for maximum growth or total return may not be interested in dividends. Obviously, this first question can be properly answered in a variety of different ways that fit one individual investor's needs and not the others. Nevertheless, it's a very important question relative to the type of long-term returns desired. However, I will leave answering this question to other videos. This series of videos will be dealing with calculating intrinsic value, or what I like to call true worth. The remaining two questions deal with calculating valuation correctly. Since this is the primary purpose of this video, I will add that it is also the contention in this video that the principles behind valuation are universal, as I said earlier. No matter what the investor's goals are, or whether or not a company pays a dividend, sound valuation should be adhered to. As a result, the answers to when to invest and conversely when to sell are rather straightforward. Only invest when sound valuation is present. The concept sound valuation is referred to under many different names. Some, as Ben did, called it intrinsic value. Others call it fair value, and I like to refer to it as true worth. However, all of these handles relate to a price that makes prudent and intelligent business sense. Now, Ben Graham is clearly the acknowledged father of value investing, and Ben Graham is credited with coining the phrase intrinsic value. And as most investors know, his book Security Analysis, co-authored with David Dodd and first published in 1934, represents the Bible of value investing even to this day. Ben Graham introduced principles of valuation to the investing world and established its importance regarding prudent investing practices. In the same vein, I believe that one of Ben Graham's most important contributions was in drawing a fundamental distinction between investing and speculating. Ben believed that a sound business purchased only at intrinsic value or below provided not only an adequate return but also a margin of safety. Critical. I believe that another one of Ben Graham's greatest contributions was providing us his famous formula for valuing a stock. However, before I dwell deeply into this formula, some historical perspectives regarding Ben Graham's life and world are in order. Ben Graham was born in 1894 and died in 1976. He first came to Wall Street and entered the investing world in 1914. Therefore, his formative years were most definitely influenced by the time frame known as the Industrial Revolution. The following excerpts from Wikipedia discussing the Industrial Revolution provide insight into what was happening to the world of business as Ben Graham was growing up and maturing and as he entered young adulthood. The Industrial Revolution was a period from the 18th to 19th century where major changes in agriculture, manufacturing, mining, transportation, and technology had a profound effect on the socio-economic and cultural conditions of the times. This is according to Wikipedia. 
starting in the later part of the 18th century, there began a transition in parts of Great Britain's previously manual labor and draft animal-based economy towards machine-based manufacturing. It started with the mechanization of textile industries, the development of iron-making techniques, and the increased use of refined coal. Trade expansion was enabled by the introduction of canals, improved roads, and, of course, railways. The introduction of steam power fueled primarily by coal, wider utilization of water wheels, and powered machinery, mainly in textile manufacturing, underpinned the dramatic increases in production capacity. The development of all metal machine tools in the first two decades of the 19th century facilitated the manufacture of more production machines for manufacturing in other industries. The effect spread throughout Western Europe and North America during the 19th century and eventually affecting most of the world, a process that continues as industrialization. The impact on the world was enormous. Ben Graham's formula for value, as shown here on the screen, is very straightforward. Value to Ben was earnings per share times 8.5, which was the basic fair value for a company with zero growth, plus two times the company's growth rate. Now, the influences of the Industrial Revolution on Ben Graham's thinking provide insights and perspectives on the veracity and validity of his famous formula for valuing a stock. Remember, Ben was developing his understanding of stock investing during a time when most public companies were agricultural or industrial in nature, and therefore they grew very slowly, usually between 0 to 5% per annum. Consequently, his formula for calculating the value of a stock by taking the company's last 12 months earnings per share times the answer of the equation 2 times expected earnings growth plus 8.5, again, the fair value PE for a zero growth company, made perfect sense for valuing companies in his era. In 1974, in an updated version of security analysis, Ben Graham's formula was modified. More on that later. Allegedly to consider and to adapt to changes in prevailing interest rates. Nevertheless, in this part one of my primer on valuation, I intend to offer extensive research-based evidence that validates Ben Graham's original formula as it applies to companies' growing earnings at 5% or less. But more importantly, I intend to offer mathematically-based business and economic principles that illustrate why Ben Graham's formula makes economic sense for slow-growing companies. Remember, Ben was creating this formula during a time when companies grew very slowly. In parts two and three of this Primer on Valuation series, I will introduce additional formulas that calculate true worth valuation, what Ben called intrinsic value, on companies with moderate earnings growth, followed by one on companies possessing fast earnings growth. Because I believe that these formulas make economic sense, I also believe that Ben Graham would have logically developed similar formulas that apply to more modern, faster-growing enterprises. Keep in mind that in Ben Graham's day, there were no Microsofts, Starbucks, Googles, Netflix, Apple computers, etc. Consequently, it is inconceivable to me at least that Ben Graham would have suggested multiplying Netflix's historical over 30% earnings growth rate or its over 20% consensus forecast earnings growth rate times 2 and adding 8.5 to this number in order to calculate a P.E. ratio that reflected Netflix's intrinsic value. Keep in mind, Ben Graham never saw companies growing earnings per share at such incredible rates. Nevertheless, his original formula stands the test of time today for companies growing at rates that prevailed in his era, 0 to 5%. Modern evidence of Ben Graham's formula is available through the FastGraphs Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. Therefore, the following examples are offered as clear and undeniable evidence of the validity of Ben Graham's insightful formula. Utilizing my Fundamentals at a Glance research tool, FastGraphs, I intend to demonstrate how profoundly and accurately Ben Graham's formula applies to companies growing at 5% or less. I automatically apply this formula in our tool to slow growth companies and mark each graph with the orange letters GDF. Allow me to emphasize before I show you the go to the graphs that there is no other manipulation or adjustments applied or made on these graphs except for one. We limit the maximum price-earnings ratio to 15. Now, a few words on that. Ben Graham did talk in his famed book, Security Analysis, that you should never pay more than 15 times earnings for a company. Now, he did make some adjustments to that, as I alluded to earlier, and we'll talk about a little bit more. But the bottom line is 15 P.E. ratio is an earnings yield of 6.67%. 
and it illustrates a fair valuation with a margin of safety built in, and that's why it's so important. So for clarification, an example, a company growing at 5% would theoretically command a P.E. ratio of 18.5. Two times 5% growth plus 8.5 equals 18.5. But I believe that is too high a multiple to pay for such low growth. In Series 2 of my primer on valuations, I will argue and provide logic that indicates that companies growing at 10% per annum can also command a P.E. ratio of approximately 15 because Ben Graham's formula would place too high a value on 10% growth. Although it may be difficult or even confusing to wrap your minds around the idea that both a 5% grower and a 10% grower will utilize the same price earnings ratio to identify intrinsic value, there is a logical explanation. Buying company at a sound valuation does not determine the rate of return you can earn. Instead, it means that you are making a sound purchase based on a rationally expected valuation that the marketplace will apply to a legitimate operating enterprise, in other words, a company or a stock. The rate of return, on the other hand, that an investor should logically expect to receive will be more a function of the rate of change of earnings growth that a given company is capable of generating. The faster the earnings growth rate, the higher your future return expectation should be. And I intend to demonstrate that when you invest in intrinsic value levels, your long-term rate of return will inevitably be a function of your company's earnings growth. Stated more directly, if you buy a 5% grower at its intrinsic value, your long-term capital appreciation expectation should be 5%. If the company pays a dividend, you can add that to your total return. In contrast, if you buy a 10% grower at intrinsic value, your long-term capital appreciation expectation should be 10% plus dividends as indicated of what I said above. The point is that intrinsic value inevitably manifests over time, and I'll prove that. Therefore, if you're investing under the principles of intrinsic value, you'll be making sound and intelligent decisions that do provide you a margin of safety and compensate you for the risk you take because your investment receives its value from ultimately from the cash flows it produces. The higher the growth rate, the more cash flow the company will produce, and the higher the rate of return that can be expected as a result. But perhaps most fundamentally, the reason that the same P-E ratio applies to various growth rates has to do with minimum valuations based on yields. With common stocks, it's earnings yield. However, with bonds, there's a related interest yield. Bonds set the valuation threshold. Considering that a bond is a fixed income instrument, it provides a yield that doesn't grow. Remember that. For example, a 10-year bond that pays 8% interest has a price-to-interest ratio of 12.5, the cost of 100 divided by 8, the interest rate. Or as you would more commonly find today, a 10-year corporate bond paying approximately 5% has a price-to-interest ratio of 20. There are two important points that are being made here. First, even a no-growth fixed stream of income has a value that is represented as a multiple of its yield. Second, the lower the yield, the higher the price, or the more expensive the fixed income instrument is. Ben Graham understood that intrinsic value was functionally related to fixed income rates or bond rates, and he wrote about it extensively. Ben understood that stocks and bonds were in competition with each other, and therefore simultaneously related. In many letters and papers, Ben talked about how stock P.E. ratios were affected not only by the level of bond yields, but by their changes as well. The following quotes from Common Sense Investing, the papers of Ben Graham, written by Ben Graham, courtesy of Value Hunter, provided a clear example of this point. Ben said, it seems logical to me that the earnings price ratio of stocks generally should bear a relationship to interest rates. He also said, viewing the matter from another angle, I should want the Dow or Standard & Poor's to return an earnings yield of at least four-thirds that on 20-year AAA bonds to give them competitive attractiveness with bond investments. In other words, Ben wanted the earnings yield to be a third higher than the the 20-year Treasury or 20-year corporate AAA rated corporate bonds. So his famous formula for valuing a common stock would be just a theory, of course, unless it worked in the real world. Remarkably, I've discovered that Ben Graham's formula is uncannily accurate towards measuring intrinsic value of companies with earnings growth rates between 0 and 5%. When Ben Graham's formula is applied to companies with these growth rates, I've discovered that the historical valuations that the market has valued them at correlates almost perfectly or at least very closely. Of course, as I presented above, there are sound economic reasons for this to be true. 
So on our Fast Graphs Fundamentals Driven Research Tool, it was designed to measure intrinsic value based on discounting cash flows past, present, or future. Instead of using an arbitrary discount rate pulled out of your hat, so to speak, we utilize the company's forecast earnings growth rate as our discount rate. Extensive research has led us and me to utilizing three formulas for determining intrinsic value based on the velocity or rate of change of earnings growth and or cash flows. Two of the formulas are widely accepted methods of valuing common stocks. The third formula is a modified version or extrapolation between the first two. Of course, the first formula is the one I'm covering here, which is Ben Graham's famous formula. And now let me go ahead and get into fast graphs and offer some proof of how this formula works. I'm going to start out here by looking at a graph of Edison International, which is a regulated utility. Now you can see by the fast graphs going in the graph key here, the company had a 3.39% earnings growth rate since 2007. That's you know within the 0 to 5% that I talked about. So the formula calculates a 15 PE ratio, which is what we limit it to with 3.39%. And you can see the market or normal PE ratio has been about 13. So we have a valuation range here of 13.6 to 15. The point being is you can see how closely stock price followed that. Massive scenarios like the 08, 09 recession did cause PE ratios to drop to where they got into the single digits like in February of 09. But then you can see over the course of the next several years, they just steadily moved back into the alignment between this 13 and a half to 15 PE. And then we see periods where the valuation got higher. And then we see periods where it was pretty much in line. And then we see during COVID, which is this gray bar here, we saw the valuations get real low again, down to 10 times earnings. And then again, over time, move back into alignment with that 14 or 15-ish PE ratio. Now, Edison International offers a 4.42% dividend yield currently and has an earnings yield of 6.96%. And it's a blended PE today at 14.37. You can see it's just below the orange line. Now, looking at the forecasting calculator, analysts do expect this company to have higher growth than historical, okay? So that would, you know, allow you to calculate what rates of return you might expect if you bought Edison International at today's attractive valuation, which offers a margin of safety already built in. I want to make that clear. But the historical graph clearly illustrates and proves why Edison International really f works with the formula that Ben Graham promoted to us all. And I also want to point out that you can see during periods of high valuation, especially with a low growth entity like this utility stock, that it's really an inopportune time to be buying the stock because here you paid a PE of 18 and a half on August 5th, 2016, and you would have ended up with a rate of return of only 2.1%, including dividends. You'd have actually had your capital decrease from 10,000 to 9,100. On the other hand, if you'd have bought it at a lower valuation and held it even a slightly lower time, your rate of return would be close to 6.04%. And by the way, since we're still a little bit undervalued, you can see the 2.54 relates to, it's not perfect fit, but it relates to the 3.39, as I told you I would indicate later. So this is one example of regulated utility that works very well with Ben Graham's formula. Let's move on and let's go into ConAgra brands, you know, packaged foods and meats. Once again, we see a blended PE of currently of 10.71, an earnings yield of 9.34%, a dividend yield approaching 5%. And the Graham Dodd number here now purely calculates the intrinsic value PE at 13.79, and that's very consistent with the average valuation that the market has applied. But once again, you see that the market value of the stock mirrors very closely. So for example, let's pick it here when it was at fair value on December 19th, 2003, the PE was 13.54, close to 13.79. And let's go here with a little bit of PE ratio expansion. You see that the capital appreciation was about 3.34%. That just includes a little bit of PE ratio expansion above the 2.64. But including dividends, you would have ended up making 5.21%. So the point is, valuation matters a lot. And with slow-growing companies like this, it really matters a great deal. Now, let me make a point. 
why would somebody invest in a company like ConAgra in the first place? And the reason would be for the income. Let's go into the performance report real quickly, and let's compare it with the S&P 500. And you can see that the S&P 500, the orange line here, way outproduced it in terms of capital appreciation because it had a much higher growth rate. But if we go down here into the dividend table, we see that we actually got more dividends off of ConAgra than we did the Standard & Poor's. All right, and this is without dividends being reinvested. My point being is an income investor might want to invest in this company because it's a food company, it's relatively conservative, it has attributes of the bond. It's not a bond alternative, but it does have attributes of bond. And the reason to buy this is because it's a lot safer than some of the faster growing companies we'll be talking about in future videos. And then finally, we have General Mills, which I'm going to use as an illustration. It's right pushing you know, the upside of 4.6% growth, 5% being the minimum. You can see the market is applying a historically higher valuation. But once again, you see how uncanny the 15 PE ratio is. If you wanted to buy General Mills, the market gave you ample opportunities going back to 2011. You had a home, almost a two-year period here. You had another one-and-a-half or two-year period here maybe even a four-year period coming into COVID. And then you had several little periods, including currently, where you could buy this stock at a fair value P-E ratio. But once again, if I calculate the rate of return here very quickly using the calculator function in the fast graphs, you can see that the 4.73% return is very, very highly correlated or consistent with the 4.6% earnings growth rate. Just slight variances in P.E. ratio, 15.13 versus a 15.22 account for the slightly higher capital appreciation component than the actual growth rate. But then, of course, add in the dividends and you get the 7.18% rate of return. So with these three examples, what I'm really showing here is how uncannily the Ben Graham formula works with slow growth companies. Okay, because, you know, when I showed you Edison International at the beginning, very clear that due to the regulated nature of the utility stocks, they're by definition slow but predictable growers. Therefore, they represent a quintessential example of the kind of company that our research indicates. In summary and conclusion, Ben Graham's formula for valuing a company established a solid foundation for future value investors to build upon. The small g in the formula represents your reasonably expected 7 to 10 year growth rate. Consequently, Ben Graham's formula was forward looking. In this video, I looked at modern historical performance in order to test the validity of this famous value formula. Remarkably, the formula proves itself to be very, very precise when applied to the real world that businesses that grow earnings between 0 and 5% per annum apply. Ben Graham constantly taught us that the stock market was not always rational. He pointed out that there'll be times when the markets would behave very foolishly. However, he also suggested that having an intelligent framework based on valuation would allow investors to avoid making foolish mistakes. He immortalized this market reality with his famous allegory that I like to close with, in courtesy of Wikipedia, as follows. Graham's favorite allegory is that of Mr. Market, an obliging fellow who turns up every day at the shareholder's door offering to buy or sell his shares at a different price. Often, the price quoted by Mr. Market seems plausible, but sometimes it's ridiculous. The investor is free to either agree with his quoted price and trade with him or ignore him completely. Mr. Market doesn't mind this and will be back the following day to quote another price. Wikipedia then goes on to explain the relevance of Ben Gams, of Ben's famous allegory. The point of this antidote, according to Wikipedia, is that the investor should not regard the whims of Mr. Market as a determining factor in the value of the shares the investor owns. He should profit from market folly rather than participate in it. The investor is advised to concentrate on the real-life performance of his companies and receiving dividends rather than be too concerned with Mr. Market's often irrational behavior. Well, there are sound business and economic principles behind the concept of valuation. So Ben did give us more than a formula for calculating value. He taught us that valuation matters, and it matters a lot. When you pay more than sound valuation indicates, as I often say, you will be taking more risk for potentially a much lower return than you deserve. Conversely, if you buy at a bargain price, your risk will be lower and your future returns 
potentially higher. Again, valuation matters, and it matters a lot. And as Warren Buffett said, price is what you pay, but value is what you get. And as I also like to say, it's a market of stocks and not a stock market. So mind your owned, O-W-N-E-D, your owned businesses, and quit worrying about all the other stuff. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, a.k.a. Mr. Valuation. I hope this treatise on the principles of valuation helped you a great deal. And in this part one, I covered slow-growing companies. In part two, I'm going to move to our next formula, which is the extrapolated formula I referenced, which shows how valuation works for companies growing up to 15% per annum. And then in the third video, I'll be talking about high growth stocks. I hope you stay tuned. Thanks for watching. If you like the video, ring the bell, subscribe to our channel. And finally, take a good look at FastGraphs. What a great tool to help you be smarter investors long term. Thanks for watching.